Welcome back yet again to the Law and Crime Network, folks. I'm Aaron Keller, joined by Michael Belsky, criminal defense attorney, and Jennifer Schuster, attorney as well. She's joining us yet again here on the Law and Crime Network. We're going to continue to break down the Roy Oliver case out of Texas. Uh, Michael, we were talking to you before the break. A lot of footage being thrown into this case, video footage of responding officers. But again, what's the relevance? Does this answer the key question in this case? I think we're in agreement that it really doesn't. I, I agree with you. I, I don't. I think the state has this position in this case, as they do in, in a lot of these cases. They want to show everything to the jury so that nobody could say they hid something from us or kept something from us. I don't really understand the relevancy as it relates to the incident at issue in this case. The incident at issue in this case is the shooting. And what happened in the moments before the shooting, that's what's relevant. That's what the jury is going to take into the jury deliberation room and need to think about. What happened afterwards is more, in my mind, about, as I said before, the optics and, and sort of the prejudicial nature of it. I don't understand the relevancy of this other than to suggest that the police are policing. Um, whether that looks good or bad to the jury is for the jury to decide. But as far as the, the meat of the relevancy of it is concerned, I don't think it's really going to play that big of a role in the jury's decision. I mean, maybe it, it does sort of present the optics that, look, the police responded to this and took it seriously, didn't play favors for one of their own, because one of their own is indeed the accused here. Maybe it shows that. Uh, but look, it's, it's a record of what happened here. The key of this is the juxtaposition of the officer's statement versus the apparent video of the scene, okay, the officer said that the car that this victim was a passenger in was headed towards him or a fellow officer and that officers were somehow in danger. But apparently we've got footage that suggests that the car was headed in the opposite direction and that the officer, Roy Oliver, the defendant who pulled the trigger here, either was mistaken or is lying about the situation. That's the crux of it. I suspect that at the end of the day, what the state, what the prosecution is going to do with this footage is they're going to take it and they're going to say to the jury, look at what these officers did. Look at how they handled the situation versus how Officer Oliver handled the situation moments before. These officers were calculated. They were methodical in their approach and sort of compare and contrast that to, to Officer Oliver. Now, I don't know what the relevancy of that is. They're two different situations. But my gut is, is that in a closing argument, in this case, that's what you're going to hear. You're going to hear, look at the way these officers handled it versus what happened in the moments before this. Yeah, exactly. Of course, we have the other uh, situation here that uh, is always an interesting juxtaposition, and that is when a prosecutor's office winds up trying someone that this prosecutor's office probably worked with on a number of previous cases. Right. And I've, I've represented and defended many police officers in cases not at all dissimilar from this. And it's it's a very odd situation because you're right. The state has worked with these people. The state has um, held their hands in cases in the past and now they're prosecuting them. What what's tricky in this case is that as the defense, you know, these these other police officers are testifying, but there is a taint on all of the testimony of the police because the police are portrayed in cases like this as the bad guy, the villain, and it creates a sort of reverse world in a criminal, in, in, in a criminal case, so the reverse of any other kind of case where the police, no matter whether the defendant or a witness, are sort of tainted as the bad guy and the victim, who may otherwise be aligned with a suspect in another case, not in this case. Um, you know, it's, it's a role reversal. You know? Yeah, what it should show ultimately is that nobody is uh, above the law in any respect. So, look, uh, we're going to update you folks on what's happening in court right now. They just took a break uh, just within the last minute or two for 10 minutes. So we'll be back with more live testimony in the Roy Oliver case from Texas as soon as court resumes. In the meantime, I want to listen to one of the previous clips that came up in this case of the body cam footage. This one has sound with it. Let's listen. Okay, folks, there's the body cam footage that shows the incident, shows the shots being fired, shows the car taking off and leaving the scene. Officers there trying to break up some kind of disturbance, something going on, and then it resulted in those shots fired. We are con going to continue to break this down during the break in court, which we're expecting to last about five more minutes. Jennifer Schuster also with us this afternoon uh, and uh, along with Michael Belsky. And of course, the disclaimer, Jennifer, that you and I were competitors about <laughs> 12 years ago and, and here we are again. 
That's right. Good to see you, Aaron. Good to see Good you. To be back in the fray. Uh, so, look, let, let's break this down. What do you make of this footage of this case, the Roy Oliver case in Texas? So this footage that we just saw, um, you know, it's nighttime. I see a lot of commotion. I see a lot of chaos. But I also see that car that's in question backing away. Um, and, of course, that's been uh, the focus of the prosecution throughout this, that we've uh, that these these kids weren't driving toward uh, this officer, but they were rather driving away. Um, you know, on the other hand, we hear the gunshots, five gunshots, and even the video analyst uh, for the prosecution testified that that happened over the course of a le less than a second. You know, so I see elements here that help the prosecution, but also I think in some ways help the defense in demonstrating that chaos and that commotion and really help quickly this all unfolded. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. Uh, look, uh, Michael Belsky, your take on this. Every one of these cases plays out exactly the same way as Jennifer just suggested. The state's goal and the state's objective is to slow the situation down, to say the police officer had this much time to respond, to think, and the, the job of the defense is to say it happened in a millisecond. It happened that quickly, and there wasn't enough time for him to respond. And I think the video, as Jennifer suggested, shows elements of both. The situation happened very rapidly. It, it was very fast. But there are sort of nuggets from the video that certainly support the state's case, the statements made, the trajectory of the vehicle, things of that nature. And I assure you that in closing argument, the state's going to come back and say, he had plenty of opportunity to see and to think and to react, and the defense is going to say it happened in a millisecond. Time is a funny thing when it comes to footage, and we're seeing that in this case. I agree with you both. Look, this is the first time I've seen this clip. I was out of town covering the Huber's case. Uh, it happened a lot faster than I would have thought, but uh, that shouldn't surprise me because we see it that way in other cases. We will be right back with more coverage of the Roy Oliver case. We hope they'll be back live in a moment. Previous testimony in the Roy Oliver case from Texas from the defendant's partner on the force. He was present in the vicinity when Officer Oliver shot and killed a 15-year-old named Jordan Edward. Of course, we're going to continue to break this case down here on the Law and Crime Network. Jennifer Schuster, Michael Belsky, both attorneys, both with us now. Uh, I'll start with you, Michael. We've got the partner on the force, uh, and we heard an objection at one point in there when he tried to get at whether or whether counsel, I should say, tried to get it, whether this attorney was heading away from the location where Officer Oliver was standing or whether it was heading towards him. Well, it's pretty speculative to ask that question, number one. And number two, I think the, the point is that Officer Gross's position is different than Officer Oliver's position. And I'm not sure what the relevancy of, of what Officer Gross perceived relative to that is to the actions of Officer Oliver. And I'm assuming that was the basis of the objection. What is interesting is that um, I understand that, that um, Officer Oliver's attorneys did not give an opening statement at the beginning of the trial, which, is, as you know, is a very unusual position to take. And my guess is that they did not because they wanted to hear how Officer Gross's testimony came out, because there are pieces of his testimony that are very supportive, whether they sound like it or not, of what I pretend or what I believe um, Officer Oliver's defense will ultimately be. And my gut is that they were waiting to hear how Officer Oliver, uh, Officer um, Gross testified before locking themselves into a defense of the case, because there were certainly nuggets of information. They may have been hidden, but they were in there that I believe Officer, um, the defendant's uh, attorneys are going to latch on to. Yes, certainly this is a tactic that we see from time to time here on Law and Crime, where a defendant will reserve the right to give an opening sometimes after the state rests its case in chief uh, and uh, before any defense case, which here certainly I would expect, uh, Jennifer, pluses and minuses to, do it, to, to doing it that way. You know, from a strategic standpoint, I think you don't want to always show your hand. And also, you don't really know what that hand may be at this point. They're uh, still cultivating that argument based on the evidence that the state is presenting. Um, I think in this instance, it probably um, doesn't hurt them any. Um, as they're hearing from this officer and determining the best way to approach it. Yeah, um, we'll have to wait and see how things are going to play out here. Just to update you folks listening at home, we have Philip Hayden on the stand. He is a use of force expert. Interesting point to see uh, this particular individual called. We're going to cut back to court now live. Again, this is the Roy Oliver case from Texas, the case of an officer accused of shooting and killing a 15-year-old named Jordan Edward. 
as that 15-year-old was heading away from the scene that the officers had been called to. The victim was a passenger in the car that was leaving. Was the car potentially a threat or was the car actually fleeing? That's one of the questions the jury's got to answer. Let's listen now live to this use of force expert. Welcome back yet again, folks. Aaron Keller here on the Law and Crime Network, and we are continuing to bring you live coverage of the trial of police officer Roy Oliver. He's a Texas officer accused of shooting and killing 15-year-old Jordan Edward. The shots rang out after the officer and his partner were called to a scene where there was a lot of commotion. The question for the jury is whether or not this officer was protecting a fellow officer by firing the shots. Jennifer Schuster is on the line with us. She's an attorney in Chicago. Jennifer, good to see you again. We are uh, listening to testimony here from this use of force expert, and he says, look, no reasonable officer would have started pumping bullets into this car that was trying to make a getaway from the scene. I keep going back to my constitutional law that says use of force like that is not reasonable in trying to capture someone who might be a suspect, even if these guys were suspects. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and what's important here is did the uh, defendant in this instance, Roy Oliver, believe that there was imminent danger to his partner? Um, and this expert here is making a lot of very emphatic statements saying that the officer could see, he could see well, there's absolutely no way he would have perceived a threat. I mean, he's essentially even eliminating the possibility that Roy Oliver could have perceived these things. Um, I think the defense will go back and argue um, that it's easy for an expert to sit behind the safety of his desk and slice and dice this and come to those conclusions. I agree. I mean, I'm expecting to see another case of competing experts. But is this a case, Jennifer, where the jury is going to zone in on the video and say, frame by frame, we disagree with the officer's interpretation? Uh, and are they allowed to do that legally? Or is this one of these things where the officer can say in the moment, in the heat of things, when everything was going around and it was chaos at the scene, I perceived this as a legitimate threat. And could they discredit the officer with that? You know, I think the jury is going to look at the evidence presented by the prosecution, which does include those 3D renderings, um, that slow-mo of uh, the video. Uh, and so to that end, they will dissect the video. But at the same time, they'll probably be somewhat receptive to the defense's argument, which will be that you really can't, you know, slice and dice this and, and sit behind a desk, you know, months after it happened and say, oh, this officer could have, should have done this. The reality is, is that this officer himself was in the trenches with hundreds of screaming teenagers around him, shots being fired, lots of chaos, uh, and that officer himself was living this in real time. And those are two very different worlds, the expert's analysis and the police officer actually living it. Certainly, uh, I agree with that assessment. Uh, here, I have to wonder, though, I mean, if officers are trained to look for very specific clues, you know, is the car coming toward me or is it not? And they are trained to size up a situation in a split second. And here, if the officer didn't do that correctly, is the jury going to turn around and nail him for that? And sure, we all know that officers are trained to be astute and to manage those biological responses, that fight or flight adrenaline response that kicks in. But, you know, on the other hand, officers, police officers, they're not superheroes. They're not superhuman. And the defense, I'm sure, will zero in on that, that, you know, to some extent, it's reasonable that they would perceive fear in certain situations. So I think it's just a matter of whether uh, the jury thinks that the police officer should be held to this standard where uh, he should be capable of ascertaining uh, these, these moments and shutting down those responses, or if it seems reasonable enough that he would respond the way he did. Yes, we're going to switch back to court now. Again, this use of force expert is still on the stand in the Roy Oliver case from Texas. We're going to continue to listen to his testimony now. Welcome back yet again to the Law and Crime Network, folks. We are following many cases here today. Let's start to break them all down. The Roy Oliver case, 15-year-old Jordan Edward was shot and killed by that police officer. He says he was defending a fellow officer or potentially protecting that fellow officer. The body camera footage shows another situation. The body camera shows that 15-year-old being a passenger in a vehicle that was leaving a scene. Questions as to whether or not that officer fired under the color of the law or whether this was something much more sinister, illegal. 
We've been talking about that case for a while. Jennifer Schuster, an attorney in Chicago, has been with us to break that case down. Jennifer, I know you need to run, but it was great to see you here on Law and Crime. You too, Aaron. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, we will catch up again soon.